You may have heard of dry ice, which is carbon dioxide that has been frozen into a solid. At room temperature, it sublimes or transitions from a solid to a gas. It is used for special effects with fog or to help transport some medical supplies such as the new COVID vaccine. Liquid nitrogen, which we'll be using for demonstrations, also forms a fog because the cold temperatures cause water vapor in the air, which we normally can't see, to condense, kind of like clouds. But surprisingly, it's way colder than dry ice even though it isn't a solid. In fact, liquid nitrogen is two and a half times colder than the lowest temperature ever measured on Earth. For nitrogen to be a liquid, it has to be minus 320 degrees Fahrenheit, which is even colder than the air over Pluto. So how do we store liquid nitrogen, and what do we use it for? Very cold liquids are called cryogens, and are stored in vessels called dewars, which are very similar to an insulated thermos. Otherwise, they would boil and completely transition to gas almost immediately. We use liquid nitrogen in our lab to maintain the strength of our superconducting magnets and sometimes to cool our biological samples for storage. Here is a magnet in our lab, and here is a cutaway showing what it looks like on the inside. There is a superconducting coil. The current in this coil creates a magnetic field. A liquid helium tank surrounds the coil. A vacuum shell provides insulation. This is the doer, and then a liquid nitrogen tank to preserve the liquid helium. All of this is to keep the coil as cold as possible so that we maintain the very large magnetic fields required to do our research. Here you can see we are doing maintenance, adding liquid nitrogen to replace what has evaporated. We do this about once a week. As you can see by the vent, if we didn't have the doer and left it open to the atmosphere, all of our cryogens would evaporate pretty fast. From here, we are about to enter the realm of physics known as thermodynamics, which describes how heat, or more precisely, energy, moves. If this makes you question why you're watching this video, don't let it make you worry. One of the most important things to remember is that without any intervention, heat will flow from a hotter or more energetic item to a colder or less energetic one. Just like the super hot sun heats up this cool pup. Let's revisit that intro shot real fast to see a neat example of this in action. I just dumped liquid nitrogen on the floor, so why does it look like a bunch of little droplets are coming toward you, rather than a wave? This is caused by the Leiden frost effect. While this might sound new, you may have experienced this if you've ever cleaned a hot pan with cold water. The water evaporates so quickly when in contact with the hot surface of the pan that it forms a layer of vapor that causes it to stay in the shape of a ball rather than spreading out like a puddle. They bounce around or float until it's almost all gone. Here the tap water is much colder than the hot pan. Because liquid nitrogen is so cold, the room temperature floor, which seems normal to us, is the relative equivalent of the hot pan. In the case of something freezing, the comparatively warm liquids transfer their energy to the cold environment. This loss of energy from the liquid causes its molecules to slow, and it becomes a solid. Let's see what happens when we freeze things with liquid nitrogen. Here we have a carnivorous plant pitcher, a cone flower, and a patchouli leaf. These are various parts of plants that we are studying in the lab. Here, I'm squishing the patchouli leaf in my hand to show that it has some elasticity in that I can compress it and it will return to its starting shape. These pieces of plants are also ductile or flexible because I can bend them and they do not crack or break. This is a property of the molecules and structures that make up these plant pieces. What do you think will happen when we put these pieces of plant into the liquid nitrogen? Will they just get colder? Will they shrivel up? Will they explode? Pause the video if you want to write down your hypothesis. While you think about what will happen to the plants, let's look at what happens to the liquid nitrogen when we put the plants inside.
do you see the bubbles? What do you think is happening? Does it remind you of anything? While normal for us, the plants at room temperature, around 70 degrees Fahrenheit, are extremely hot compared to the liquid nitrogen. So hot, in fact, they are making it boil immediately because they're transferring their energy into the cold liquid. Pretty neat, huh? We could use this to know that what we have dipped in the liquid nitrogen has cooled to the same temperature when the boiling stops. But because we put a big basket in, it would take a long time, so we aren't going to let it cool all the way. So let's take them out now and see what happens. I'm going to squeeze the plants the same as before, wearing my cryogenic glove to protect my hand from the cold temperature because if liquid nitrogen came into contact with my skin, it would cause frostbite. Okay, here we go. The leaf is now hard but it also cracks into a bunch of different pieces when put under the same stress from my hand. Why is that? To understand this, we must first think about what plants are mostly made of. Water. So a large part of what we are creating is ice, but because the temperature difference is extreme, and water freezes at just negative 32 degrees Fahrenheit, it happens almost immediately. Two things are largely at play here. One, H2O, or water, is most often a crystalline solid, and this makes it brittle. Two, water ice also expands when it freezes, as you may have observed with an ice cube tray, or by putting a water bottle in the freezer. Inside the plant, this breaks open the cells and disrupts the structural integrity of the plant fibers, further weakening them. Plastics are another type of amorphous solid known as a polymer, something that is made up of chains of repeating molecules bonded together. Going back to what we learned earlier, things that are ductile have molecules that can slide around each other. So in this case, you can imagine the polymer is sort of like tiny spaghetti noodles. These make what we call amorphous solids, which means that they are not highly ordered, like the flexible rubber hose from the nitrogen transfer, or the more tasty example of cotton candy. When we apply force to something amorphous, it deforms instead of breaking, which is often the case with many plastics. We are going to demonstrate this with the bottle cap at room temperature. Notice how when we hit it with the hammer, it stays intact and slides out from under the pressure, leaving it perceivably undamaged. We can change the plastic to be more crystalline by lowering its temperature below what is called the glass transition. You may have noticed that during the liquid nitrogen transfer, the rubber hose became rigid. If I had applied stress to it at this point, it would have been brittle and cracked or shattered because the molecules had aligned to a lower energy configuration where they are less mobile, making them more crystalline. Crystalline solids are more highly ordered and exhibit properties more like true crystals. Sticking with the candy analogy, this makes them more like rock candy. This means when we apply a force to them, instead of deforming, the stricter alignment leads to cracks or breaking into smaller pieces. Let's observe this when we put the cap in liquid nitrogen and compare what happens. This time it shatters, showing that it has transitioned from being ductile to brittle, similar to what we saw with the plants. 
Now that we have demonstrated how liquid nitrogen can be used to induce phase changes, let's examine another application that you can mimic at home. Have you ever noticed that your bicycle tires feel a little more squishy or flat after being outside on a cold night or during the winter? This is because the kinetic energy, or how fast the gas molecules are moving inside the tire, is directly related to the temperature. I will now demonstrate an extreme version of this with a balloon and liquid nitrogen. Using this new information and what you have learned about the transfer of energy in thermodynamics earlier, what do you predict will happen? Do you see anything changing? Did you predict that the balloon would deflate? You can see now that the balloon's a bit smaller and has wrinkles and almost looks flat. As the temperature decreases, the gas molecules move less. Ultimately, this creates fewer collisions with the balloon wall, which is essentially lower pressure. This is the same thing that happens with your bike tire, just faster and more obvious because the difference in temperature is much greater almost 13 times as much, where the bike tire goes from 70 degrees Fahrenheit to 40 degrees Fahrenheit on a winter night, the balloon is now going from 70 degrees Fahrenheit to minus 320 degrees Fahrenheit. Just as the pressure in the balloon almost instantly decreased and continued to do so as long as it was in contact with liquid nitrogen, when we take it out, it begins to expand again. As the temperature of the balloon now increases, and the gas molecules inside of it start to speed up. Slowly, it'll return to the original size that we started with. So we can see that this process is reversible, meaning that we can collapse the balloon and it is able to re-expand to the way it started. Let's watch this one more time, except this time we'll also let you listen to what's happening. Listening to the crackle of the balloons, you can hear them pass through the glass transition point that we talked about earlier. As the balloons come back from being cold, they again return to being more amorphous rather than brittle. Something else interesting happens at the spot where the balloon was touching the foam. It appears to still be cold. This is because the foam is a thermal insulator, or does not conduct heat, and therefore the heat of the room cannot be transferred to the balloon at that spot until it is no longer in contact with the foam, or it heats up from the inside of the balloon. Now it's your turn to experiment. While we hope you will be able to visit our lab someday, in the meantime, you can try this at home. In your kit, we have provided you with several balloons. Try inflating one to about 75% or so of its capacity. Next, try to blow up a second and third balloon to the same circumference. This may mean holding it by the mouthpiece to allow for adjustments before tying it off. 
You can measure the circumference or distance around the widest part of the balloon using a tape measure or some string and a ruler. Marking where you measured the widest point will help when it comes time to re-measure at the end. On the worksheet, we have provided space to take three measurements because this is a good scientific practice to ensure that our measurements are consistent. Because we are trying to evaluate the effect of temperature on the size of the balloon, keep one balloon at room temperature as your control or reference, and then use the others for the experiment. Place one in either the freezer, if you have room, or in an insulated sunny spot, such as on a piece of plastic or on the dashboard of the car for about 45 minutes to an hour. While you wait, make a hypothesis for what you think will happen. Then measure the circumference of the experimental balloon and compare it to the measurement for the control balloon. If you can't measure them, hold them next to each other and note if you see any difference. Based on what you have learned in this video, what do you think will happen in each case? Was it as fast or as much as in our video? Anything else you noticed? Let us know. All right. Sadly, we've come to the end of this demo, which means we have come full circle to the start. To dispose of the extra liquid nitrogen, we can simply toss it on the floor as long as it is in a well-ventilated room or a large open area like the hallway. This is because from the volume it occupies as a liquid, about a liter, it'll expand to 694 times that as a gas. To put this in perspective, that would be enough gas to fill the standard four-person hot tub. We hope you enjoyed this video and look forward to showing you the lab in person in the future. Be sure to comment below to tell us what happened to your balloons and what else you would like to see dunked in liquid nitrogen. Finally, please comment with whatever questions you may have, and we will try to get back to you soon. Check out the links to our website and email for more information and to stay tuned for a live question and answer session at a later date.